Okay, volume two. Every year, there are multiple Steam Next Fests, a short time that video game developers put out a demo of their game. It's only a week long, it's kind of like a sneak peek. Sometimes by weeks, and sometimes by months, sometimes by years, before we get to see, you know, the final thing. Because of the demo state, you know, experiences are pretty uh, cut together for better or for worse, so I'm not gonna judge things too harshly. Sometimes the experience is much more uh, filling in the uh, final product, but at least you get a general feel for what the experience is gonna be. I'm gonna be playing as many of the over 400 games as possible in the short time they're available, trying to find things I like and learn what cool new stuff developers are doing. So let's dive into this season's Steam Next Fest, Volume. Two. Duck Detective, the secret salami, developed and published by Happy Broccoli Games, a uh, cute, simple, and funny Duck Detective and the Secret Salami is a direct and simple noir story about a duck that can't get a break and has a pretty serious bread problem. Something of a Paper Mario meets the Ober Din. The mysteries themselves are at times the punchlines of the jokes. I really liked the demo. The art style and writing is what really is doing the heavy lifting here. But uh, it also felt pretty solidly built. It would have been simple to throw something like this together, but there's a general level of craftsmanship at work and uh, has terrific music and very enjoyable voice acting. There's also a bit of fun with kicking around objects and cans and such and in-scene interactivity. I just wish it was a bit longer for the demo. A few minutes uh, makes me think, I wonder really how long the actual game's gonna be. Not to be that person that's always wanting a longer game or anything. Uh, I appreciate plenty of shorter experiences. I'm just curious, you know, to see what the final product is like. I'll be keeping my eye on this. Duck Detective, The Secret Salami, releasing sometime this year. The year 2024. Harold Halibut is one of those games I've been waiting for for years. Mixed medium games is what I want more of in the industry, and developers and publishers, slow bros, uh, name themselves accordingly. Not only does the clay animation look fantastic in this game, but the content is referential to a time and material that revolves around many references to a previous generation of British television. At least, uh, that's what my rudimentary read of the material is, with my, uh, you know, super in-depth knowledge of British TV from the 60s and 70s. Anyway, with an experience that's uh, somewhere between Grim Fandango meets Quantic Dream Games meets a Wes Anderson movie, the undersea conspiracy of fish protesting and my fond memories of Wallace and Gromit make me heavily invested in this game still. I will say something that came up with a few games this binge was the long time conversation around how do you balance heavy amounts of frames and realistic locomotion of a character with responsive gameplay. It's not something this game should be too worried about with a click and point heritage, but nonetheless my love for Harold Halibut and Claymation is still alive and well. It's due to release sometime this year. Mouthwashing. Wrong Organ, developed and published. Gorgeous renderings and character models that get me remembering Mega Man Legends. Mouthwashing is a semi-surreal psychological horror experience kind of thing that gets you even when you're on guard. The plot is pretty unhinged, just enough to keep me asking what the heck is going on at times uh, during the demo. Uh, nothing really makes sense, though its corporate Wayland yutani roots are pretty clear. It was brief but motivating, and the music works uh, super well. Mouthwashing is beautiful and twistedly funny, and I'm hoping I'm playing it sometime this year in the first quarter. Developed by Hammer95, published by them and Epopola Games, Mullet Mad Jack, 
is uh, part of the current timeline that many of this round of games have shown inspirations from Hotline Miami. And uh, Mullet Mad Jack takes the cake on that. If uh, Hotline and Void Bastards fused with every 80s anime I've ever seen, you would probably get something like this. Uh, that's pretty high-level praise coming from me, who has a soft spot that could kill me at any second for a really old anime. You have 15 seconds to live on easy, and it's a never-ending mishmash of level layouts and power-ups each level. I really ate this game up. It's like Running Man meets Akira. Pretty darn funny writing, and a corporate overlord satire, and infinite save the influencer plot. It's uh, super fast-paced, super fun, and it's slated as coming soon in 2024. Orsted, published and developed by individual Kex. I really love smart minimalist city builders, and Orsted is certainly that. With a large proven success through its demos on itch.io, individual Kex uh, clearly has a love and eye for what makes a light city builder meaningful. It's got a visual style that reminds me of how I lost half a year to the game Bad North a few years ago. I didn't want to stop playing the Orsted demo to make this video, but time ticks on. One of my favorite aspects of the game was the soundtrack and the soundscape. That gives you a slowly evolving experience and it dynamically changes as time and events go on. Also, if you zoom out, you notice the townsfolk building is uh, proximity, so you can just sail alone above the skies with the soundtrack, which was pretty lovely. I like little details like that in games when the experience has little things that tell you your time's not just respected, but it's also coveted. It's uh, super well done, and I'm definitely coming back. Orsted is to be released on March 6th. Pacific Drive has more coverage than most of the games on the demos this year. Um, it's developed by Ironwood Studios and published by Kepler Interactive. I wasn't sure what the core gameplay loop was going to be for this game, but after playing the demo I'm much more sold. Sitting somewhere in between a Fallout meets Okamotive's Far gameplay, and if you don't know Okamotive's Far series, you should probably play it because it's good. It has a look that's like Pixar did Ghostbusters. It's super charming and has you loving car maintenance, a super fast. There's moments I felt like I was on a road trip and there's times I was in a 80s montage in my garage fixing up my car. I'm happy with what the loop is. There's discrete loading zones. You scavenge items, uh, further your car and gears evolution. For years, I thought it might be like a stranding type game with a car. I wasn't exactly sure how that would feel with inventory management and crafting being super core components. I did notice the voice work was a little hot and needed me to turn it down specifically, but it's a demo. It's a pretty light complaint. This might also be the only game that I didn't know if I should use a gamepad or a mouse and keyboard. The driving pushes me into the gamepad kind of feeling, but the exploration made me want to do a mouse and keys. It's an interesting problem, and this isn't the only game I ran into something like that with this round of demos. Pacific Drive is coming February 22nd, so if you always wanted to take care of a station wagon during a supernatural crisis, you don't have to wait long to do so. Pepper Grinder, developed by Rek and published by Devolver Digital, is a 2D pixel action-adventure game, and its main mechanic is got me thinking swimming in Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze meets Echo the Dolphin. It's super light on story and heavy on interesting music. The mechanic uh, usually used for traversal in other games is expanded to a pretty cool degree. With a demand for player agility, right when you think uh, you couldn't develop a puzzle or mechanic to further what they're working with, they one-up you. I like my time, even though it's a core mechanic, felt a little bit wild at times. Pepper Grinder is set to release sometime this year of 2024. Rotwood is developed and published by Klee. 
who has an impressively broad genre of games under their belt, if you're not aware of who they are. They're always beautiful and often caring about a co-op viewpoint. Rotwood makes me think, uh, what if Klee made a roguelike Castle Crashers dungeon crawler? Starting with an interesting and inclusive animal character builder, I found myself enjoying a responsive combat as well as acquiring fun, super interesting moves and upgrades. Like there was a double tap roll to make two ends of a portal that you could use both offensively and defensively and portal from one point to another. And then your enemies would also go through the portal, which made things interesting. It was super cool and it was kind of a brief experience at the demo, but I'm excited to see how it develops over the years or months or weeks. Uh, they're not planning on releasing this anytime soon because it's to be determined. Star Trucker, developed by Monster and Monster, published by Raw Fury, brought me back to when I roleplayed as a space trucker in Dreadnought for a year. But with this game, it's much more on point and a better experience. And uh, the game does not let down, if that's your dream situation. The tutorial was super effective and brief, and exactly what I need from a complex systems game like this. I was uh, fast to learn that all the items in my rig will fly everywhere if you don't slow down properly. And also, if you love trucking or space sims, you should definitely play it because it lets you in on the abuse of delivery contracts and crazy drivers. I was deducted 80% of my fee for carelessness and the exploits of the trucking industry got a little too real for me. Star Trucker is due to release sometime in 2024. Stormgate is another high profile game that was doing its beta testing during the Steam Next Fest. Developed and published by Frost Giant Games, I'm someone that plays through StarCraft once every year, so Stormgate definitely had my attention for quite some time now. At first, I wasn't sure how I felt about dealing with like new groups or teams or legions or tribes or whatever. Uh, the love of quotable StarCraft characters doesn't leave you easily. But soon, through my first skirmish, me against some bots, I began to notice it has all the staple points of the StarCraft experience with many quality life improvements from auto-adding units to hockey groups to the addition of neutral monster camps in the field. It's clear that Stormgate's not fooling around and they've merged like the MOBA signatures into their StarCraft successor from the ground up. It doesn't bother me. I'm not a massive MOBA player, but it is uh, something I dabble in from time to time. I understand it not only makes sense for them to build with these markets and features in mind, but it does make it more interesting and strategic in the battle. I enjoyed my time a lot, and of course I'm going to get Stormgate. Minus a few minor LOD moments, it was a smooth and bugless experience. I probably won't be going competitive anytime soon, so I'm hoping that there's an equally compelling lore narrative and campaign to go along with their newly developed IP. Stormgate is coming soon. Ultros. Ultros is developed by Haddock and published by Kepler Interactive. I had seen Ultros at Day of the Devs in December, and I love video games, but sometimes the saturation of a certain genre can become a thing I need to be in the mood for. Ultros has taught me a lesson that I need to engage with games when they're ready, not when I'm ready. A blacklight poster waiting to decompose your body, Ultros is clear about its fungal Metroid inspirations, but it doesn't stop where many would have. It has all the staple points you'd expect from a Metroidvania, however there's a depth and consideration for many aspects other games have overlooked. There's a tightly integrated mechanic of juggling an enemy in a direction given a short pause for redirection. It's uh, fairly effective and fun. The combat will punish you for sloppiness and has approachable and balanced leveling system. You receive items from kills and those items feed into separate skill regions differently. The more you eat, the more points you get for those levels and skill up. The game's art style is obviously noticeable, but taught me much more about game design than I was expecting. 
I always think of clear communication and readability on a screen during gameplay, and there's been many art-heavy metroidvanias that don't care much about that. Arriving in an alien land with your space ninja, I noticed that the fastest, easiest way to teach a game's visual language might not always be the best. Slowly getting educated on your surroundings, on what is or isn't an enemy, is just as much a part of gameplay narrative as anything else. And being a character in an unknown place, and us slowly learning along with them, is a compelling feature of gameplay. Altrus also brings up the conversation of responsiveness and character movement, balancing how many frames of animation and detail are given to them. A problem pixel-based art, with its immediate jumps from one movement to the next, rarely has. But this conversation is timeless, and I found Ultros nonetheless responsive and felt very good. By the end of my time with it, I was an agile space ninja tearing through an alien land, planting seeds, sleeping in strange pods, and taking names. Ultros is due to come out February 13th. Developed by Polychroma and published by Maximum Entertainment, until then does that beautiful thing that I love. 2D pixel art in 3D spaces with real-time lighting. This had the talent to make me feel like a terrifically written anime merged with the game Night in the Woods. From its skillfully immersive and cinematic start, to its texting mechanics and bespoke mini-games, until then went from a game I thought would be more in line with a visual novel, to having me laugh and blush along with characters, praising it for every move it made. I loved it more than I wanted to admit, just because of how well it got me. It does have that PC game thing that it often is split between key interactions and mouse interactions at times. I want to lose myself in the story and not be like, how do I, oh, it's a mouse thing. But that's also part of an immersive move for certain interactions, so it's difficult to fault it, especially when it does what it does so dang well. My playthrough took an hour and a half, has a strangely mysterious plot looming, and I want more as soon as possible. Please play it. Until then, it's coming soon. Dreamcore, developed and published by Mantralas, a psychological horror game, and did I just get locked in this building after closing experience extravaganza, Dreamcore did things to me no game should legally be allowed to do. It scared me. It bored me. It gaslit me. It did things that impressed me more than anything I've ever played. And it did things I never want to experience again. I'm so torn up from my experience with Dreamcore's demo that I felt like I should seriously rethink being involved with video games in any way. It's a gorgeous and haunting experience, and it took me three hours to complete. And knowing what I know now, I'll probably buy and play the rest of it when it comes out. Because I feel like Dreamcore knows something about me that I don't. And I want to know what that is, because I'm sick in the head. Dreamcore comes out soon. So that's it for volume two. Wasn't that fun? It's starting to feel like a lot. At this point, I've only played around 60 games and there's still so many more to do. We'll see how many more I get through. I'm excited to see more games, but also I'm starting to feel like it's not a lake, it's an ocean kind of feelings. As always, if you have any recommendations, inspirations, salutations, feel free to tell me. If you think I love or hate something, I want to know. Uh, reach out if you got any recommendations. And uh, yeah, that's about it. This has been Fib Likely and play games. Uh, no, but seriously, play, play more games, please. <laughs>